This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hmm, 12 o'clock on a given Friday. You know, I am not Stan Osserman. I, <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel. I'm standing in for him. I'm standing, get, the, get that. I get it, get standing it. Standing in for him. Nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's uh, John Nauchi. He's the Deputy Director of the Department of Transportation Services here in the city and county of Honolulu. And we're together uh, on Stan's show, uh, the hydrogen man. I'm not the hydrogen man, but we can talk about that kind of thing. So, Stan, welcome to the show. Thanks for being. I'm, I'm sorry, John. <laughs> welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, tell us. Um, you know, I mean, for those who would like your job, <laughs> tell us how you got your job. What did you study? Uh, what was the long pathway that took you there? <laughs> well, uh, without being too wordy, my long pathway probably started with where I grew up in Kahalu. Okay. I lived on a street in Kahalu. The bus came by, made a left turn in front of my house every day, every hour, for as long as I could remember growing up. And, you know, once in a while, my mom or my dad or my popo or gung gung would shuttle me onto this bus. And I think that's where I learned about reliable transit. <laughs> so fast forward through my high school, and I'll shout out to Iolani, because they're my favorite, uh -huh. and that's where I went. Uh, I did go to college in Los Angeles at uh, University of Southern California, USC, and I studied urban planning. Uh -huh. And I had a chance to experience LA immediately post Rodney King. Yeah. At a time when, you know, a lot of their infrastructure was just devastated. I mean, I arrived on the USC campus and things in the neighborhood were still literally smoking around the neighborhood, but the campus was relatively pristine. So I got to experience LA with bad transit and bad mobility and car-based mobility. And I developed, further developed my, my I, I call it my transit geekiness um, for studying transit systems and how they work. It's actually a thing um, <laughs> by kind of experiencing LA. And when I came home, I wanted to apply the knowledge I learned in urban planning. My, I studied um, urban planning with an emphasis in transportation. I wanted to kind of bring that home and figure out a better way to, better path to mobility for Honolulu's residents. So upon returning home, I, I took up work at Oahu Transit Services, OTS. They're the contracted management and operations for the city's, the bus system. Mm -hmm. Worked for them for 16 years, um, left there as a director of planning and service development, um, moved over to Hart for a little bit, did um, deputy director of planning, environment, and culture, and was appointed last, well, in 2016 by Mayor Caldwell to uh, be in his cabinet as deputy director of DTS. So I'm I like to actually kind of proudly say, if I'm going to toot my own horn a little bit, I may be the only person on this island who's worked in bus, rail, and rail, and um, paratransit, which is our handy van to you know, be able to kind of be in the really uniquely situated position to kind of bring it all together now. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that, you're yeah. perfect. I used to say sometimes, like I, I got to quarterback the thing, throw it down the field <laughs> and then do the Marcus Mariota and then catch it again. So, no, it's, it's, I'm not that. I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, deputy in DTS, what does he do? The deputy in DTS oversees um, a number of divisions, which include um, our traffic signals and technology, our traffic engineering, transportation planning, and our public transit division. Um, within those falls the responsibility of what's called complete streets, and the city adopted um, an ordinance to, uh, to um, implement complete streets, which equalizes um, no preference over mode or balances out um, preference for bikes, peds, um, transportation, cars, and buses. Complete Streets is yours. Complete Streets falls oh, within really my Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I hope we have time to talk about that yeah. a little bit. But let's talk about the news first. Always the news first. Top down, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so the news is the electric bus. Yes. This is really interesting. And somebody told me they saw one. It really looked beautiful. Yeah. And uh, it was, you know, it harkens a new time. Can you talk about it? Yeah. Um, that's actually been one of my passion projects um, under Mayor Caldwell's leadership um, and Councilmember Joey Monahan has been, they've been very um, front facing in terms of pushing us to get electrification of transportation and have that incorporated more into our DTS's um, immediate and future goals. So um, the city basically began what we had hoped to be a year-long demonstration program in which we opened our doors to bus manufacturers who have electric vehicles to come and demonstrate um, their buses in Honolulu's transit environment. And when I say that, I, I, it is really an environment. 
It's we, different than other environments, yeah? Yeah, and everybody likes to think they're different. Yeah. But I would point out that in Honolulu, we have the fifth highest per capita transit ridership. And that says a lot because in that top five, top six, top seven, we're the only ones without an active rail component. So just with our bus system, we are one of, we have maybe one of the most heavily utilized bus systems in the nation. And that's something that most people don't realize. I think if you think Honolulu, you think I have to have a car. But it's changing. It's changing. And I would actually put it out there that everybody is talking now about TOD. TOD, Transit Oriented Development. And I like that it's in everybody's mindset and everybody's considering it as, oh, this is something we're going to do now. And I'll, I'll nod and I'll agree, but I'll contend that we've always had TOD here. The Honolulu that we know, the old urban city, is based on the streetcar system that was developed. The 12 <laughs> miles of streetcar that we used to have <laughs> is basically TOD. You run up and down King and Baratania streets in downtown. Tell the people yeah. what it is and how it works and how it benefits us. It's this idea that um, the city should have a, a more compact footprint. You should be able to get around. You should be able to do everything you need to do without requiring a car. Now, I'm not going to malign anyone who, like my former predecessor planners, who thought that we should sprawl to the suburbs. We should have you know neighborhoods with nice looping streets and cul-de-sacs because that's what the rest of the nation was doing. And we went along with that as an, an, almost an American ideal. Was that the yard? You know the American family, but now a cul-de-sac in everybody's pot. A cul-de-sac in everyone's neighborhood. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you know when you look at it, we had TOD in the 1900s, and those neighborhoods that were established by that are still thriving and are still vibrant. You know, and if you look at even Waialai and Kaimuki, Kaimuki was the answer to probably Honolulu's first affordable housing crisis. So we had a sustainable transit system that was electric powered. And like the rest of America, a lot of us gave it over to diesel. And so that was a big evolution, probably in the 40s and 50s. And we're seeing that evolution where I don't want to sound too hipster about it because I'm probably officially a generation X or Y. -er. <laughs> but, you know, we're coming back to this ideal of putting electri electrification of transportation back in. And I find that you know we're on the cusp of it, and I'm kind of happy that we get to see this ushered back in. I'm not going to go back and start using manual typewriter, but I like to see the quiet vehicles coming back in. So TOD means you develop <clears throat> at various intervals, and those intervals are, are uh, mercantile, they're shopping, they're commercial. Uh, you and so you can always get somebody to fix your shoes, to, to sell you some groceries, whatnot, uh, within a fairly short distance. And you don't have to have a car to do that. Sure. It, it's this idea that you can live, work, and play. I mean, I think that's the simplest way to put it. Live, work, and play in a very compact area. That's not to say that everyone should be based out of their own small little village. We want to give people mobility within the region also because we still cannot turn our back on the sprawl. You know, the fact that affordable housing exists farther away from the city center. But we want to make sure that people have more of an opportunity to enjoy their own neighborhoods. And... You know, neighborhood I, is community. Neighborhood, it all begins in the neighborhood. That's right. And, and, and I think I agree with you. We, we've kind of lost touch with the notion of neighborhood where you say hello to people on the street, you walk your dog, you say hi, yeah. all that. <clears throat> and you know, the problem I see, just to compress uh, you know, this part of our discussion, is that we spent a lot of time sprawling. That was the big plan, you know, second city, all that. Um, sprawl, 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 sprawl for how many 50 years anyway? Mm -hmm. Uh, and now, and now, you know, the, the better judgment is not to sprawl. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we are trying to reverse an initiative that we spent 50 years building. This is hard. And, hard. Um, I, and it's hard to get people to, to change, turn around, too. It's hard to get them on board for this, don't you think? It, it really is. And, you know, we're coming into uh, an era where we want to transition people from, away from fossil fuels. And I think the mindset is in place. Now, how do we translate that mindset into actual forward action is really is the rub here. And I'll share something that um, Mayor Caldwell always tells me personally. And he, I think he means it maybe as a little joke, as a little knock to me as someone who has an urban planning background. But he'll always say, you planners, you always plan. You guys have a hard time implementing. You know, you guys can plan, but to implement is divine. Is that true? <laughs> well, it. planners like to but think is about it things, true? Right? Is it true that planners have trouble implementing? I think you don't strike me, actually, John, as someone who has <laughs> trouble implementing. Well, I will say, a planner's job is to plan. 
and then we hand off to engineers and other more able-bodied members to implement. So our role is to plan, but sure, I mean, I've, planners can sit around and spend hours and hours and hours planning, and maybe not, nothing will get put in the ground because of that, but we have to make sure that we can articulate our ideas that make sense and hand them off to a more technical set to actually put them in. At the same time, though, if you go to the trouble, you know, go to school, study, learn, commit your life, your, your thought process to planning, and, 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 you, and you believe that your plans are going to go on a, on a dusty shelf somewhere. That's, to me, that's unacceptable. Yeah, it's a little self-defeating. So <laughs> <laughs> you've got to, you, 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 if you want to realize your plan, your destiny, your work, have it come alive, have it flower, um, you have got to follow up and say, wait a minute, you know, you, we've got to implement this, and I'll go to great lengths, I'll even you know, push people yeah. in order to implement it. So I'm not just handing it off. I'm saying, here, now, let's do it, and I'll help yeah. you do it. And that's what I usually tell people who um, are contemplating a career in planning or contemplating going into you know, the field, even t for education. I said, you have to be okay that for every 100 ideas you have, maybe five of them will get done. And if you're not okay with that, don't enter this field. <laughs> but, and I always liken it to kind of the relay race. You know, we package the idea, and we have the baton, we hand it off, but at the same time, I can't just hand it off, let the person take it and stop running. You kind of got to run with them for a little bit yeah. just to make sure that what you had articulated, the vision you had, makes it all the way to the finish line. Yeah, and you yeah. should have some authority actually to do yeah. that. I hope Maybe it's do. just cheering for them as they finish the work that you started. Well, as DTS uh, deputy, you do have some authority, don't you? Uh, to cheer them on, uh, to ask them to be accountable, yeah. uh, not to let it die. Yeah. After all, we went to the trouble of you know planning it, then it should happen. I mean, I, 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 my feeling is there's too much planning that never goes, well, you, I'm sure you agree, yeah. that never goes anywhere. Yeah. So if you're going to go to the trouble, you might as well, you know, force the issue. Anyway, yeah. so, but going on to the news, what is the bus, the electric bus, like? Is it the same inside, outside? Um, how does it work? So this is interesting. So let me back up a little bit. Um, Mayor and Councilmember Monahan told me that they wanted to do an electric bus demonstration. And I said, okay, that's a great idea and I got the, the speech about implement. So we set up a program <laughs> for the demonstration Same to discussion. start. Same discussion, every time, every time. And I, and I, I, I say jokingly, but there's an ounce to every true <laughs> statement. But So we um, had some people answer to our call for demonstrations. The first happened to be a company called Proterra. Now what's interesting about Proterra is they're a technology company that is building a bus. Everyone else, I believe, is a vehicle manufacturer who is applying high technology to an existing platform. So one might, it begs the question for us, you know, as, as someone that operates transit, is it easier to teach somebody how to build a bus or is it easier to teach somebody how to add technology to an existing platform? So with Proterra, it's the only electric vehicle that's designed from the ground up to be an electric bus. And I found that very interesting. Um, they're based out of San Francisco. And what is another interesting uh, feature that they have is it doesn't have a stainless steel frame like most buses do. It's made out of composites. So it's manufactured in very much th of the same materials that a boat would be manufactured. Lighter so and more efficient. Lighter and more efficient. And the battery storage actually happens under the floor. So in every other electric bus, they stack the batteries on the roof because that's where space is available and they don't have to re-engineer the More stable under the floor, no? So more on the, yeah, and so having driven it before and having heard comments from our bus operators who do drive it, they say it does, it turns and it is nailed to the ground. Yeah. Um, this makes for a better ride. It sure does. Yeah. It really does. And I think one of the, the moments of realization I had that this was completely different I was standing on the intersection of Baratania and Punchbowl, which is right next to one of our most busiest stops in our system. You have all the lanes of traffic coming up and down Punchbowl and Baratania, and all you could hear was the noise from the cars passing by. You couldn't the hear anything from the bus. The bus passed by, you know, yeah. it was just like, well, these buses here, you know? That's like Stan's hydrogen bus, I was telling you. It doesn't yeah. make any sound at all. And it, it, we had a lot of discussion about whether we need to add a friendly little noise that the driver can actuate. <laughs> so you don't need to tap the horn to make people aware that, I, I call it the silent green ghost is behind them. <laughs> but um, you know, when you look at that, that was a moment of realization I had was that this bus was not polluting the noise environment any more than you know, all the other cars were already doing it. Yeah. 
And when we had the press conference, we had a press conference to introduce it on um, Tuesday. It's the first time, and I noted this, the first time we've done many of these bus presentations and bus demonstrations before with diesel buses. First time we've ever actually had the press conference with the bus fully on and the AC running and everything like that. Because we could. Good we didn't, sound. Yeah, I mean, it didn't make any <laughs> sound, so we could you respond. Could put it right here in the studio, eh? Yeah. You know, I mean, you'd hear a little whooshing because of the AC <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, but it's not significantly a, a noise polluter, no environmental effect in that. So, sense. one more question before we go to the break, John. Mm -hmm. um, what does it cost? It, I always say right now, an electric bus will cost about one and a half times our standard diesel bus. So, we're talking about more than half a million? Uh, yeah, a standard diesel bus costs a little bit north of half a million dollars. So talking about seven fifty or so. Yeah, so even even numbers, nice easy math because I'm a planner, I'm not a mathematician. I always like to think of five hundred thousand and seven hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, um, you know, you got issues about raising, and you have to bet, you have to buy it cash, no? Yeah. Um, we or, can or buy can with you buy federal it on funding. credit too. Uh, federal funding. Ah, okay. Yeah. So the feds um, have a lion's share of our vehicle purchases, and we provide a local match to start it and the feds buy the rest of it. Okay, yeah. when we come back from this break, we're gonna find out how many of these buses John wants to <laughs> put down in the streets of Honolulu um, and over what period of time. That's John Nauchi, he's a, a, the uh, deputy at DTS, the Department of uh, Transportation Services in the city and county of Honolulu. We'll be right back. Good afternoon, my name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii we show at three o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists, both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Aloha, my name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, not Stan Osterman. I like him very much, though. Uh, and this is Stan the Energy Man on a given Friday at noon. And we have John Nauchi. He is the uh, deputy of the Department of Transportation Services uh, here in the city and county of Honolulu. And we're talking about the new electric bus, among other things. So um, before we left it, uh, there was a cliffhanger there. How many are you going to get? Over what period of time are you going to take to deploy them? So I am working under the mayor's guidance that um, in December, all four county mayors gathered on board the Hokulea out in Pokai Bay, out on the Waianae coast. And that was more than symbolic. The Hokulea had just done the Malama Honua voyage and learned how climate change is really affecting the rest of the world. And upon the deck of the Hokulea, all the mayors um, committed to powering their public and private vehicle fleets on in each of their counties with renewable energy by 2045. And Mayor Caldwell gave City and County of Honolulu an advanced finish line, <laughs> 2035 all for right, all public vehicles. All right, okay. So, you know, it sounds like a lot of time, but really we have 15 years to execute. It's not that much when you start looking ca carefully. It, it's not a lot. And I think what we need to do is take stock of the resources that we have. And it's more than just us appropriating money to buy these vehicles. We have to look at the infrastructure, and electric infrastructure and see what's available to us right now and how we might grow that and introduce more of the, the renewables into that electric infrastructure so we're not just burning fossil fuels to power electric vehicles. Yeah. And I think I like to use that adage, it is good times in the kingdom right now. We have been collaborating very, very, very well and with um, Hawaiian Electric. Um, they have put a pretty serious commitment to electrify transportation. It's called EOT, and hopefully as we go on, EOT, I won't have to say it means electrification of transportation. People will know what EOT means. They don't know it yet, John. They don't know it yet, so we'll start here. Okay. <laughs> and part of, part of that issue is integrating our charging needs with what the grid can hold and what the grid can provide. 
And the city recently applied for what's called a low no grant. That means low or no emission vehicles. And we're poised to bring in our first purchased electric bus, hopefully by the beginning of next year. And there is a certain story that goes along with that bus that I find you know, very like, exciting. Um, we've partnered with our long-term bus manufacturer, Gillig Corporation, out of Northern California. They're an all-American bus maker. They've been in business probably since the early 1900s. Are they healthy? They're healthy, very healthy. They've survived the San Francisco fire in the early 1900s, and they've recently just moved. Right. Wow. They moved to Hayward after that, and then they're now in Livermore, California. But we've had their buses since 1983. So we've been a long-time partner with them. They've partnered with the Cummins Corporation, now, Cummins is one of those products. Diesel. 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 Yeah. yeah, when you think diesel, you think Cummins. Yeah. Um, most people have an experience with Cummins and maybe don't even know it. They're that ubiquitous. Um, they're a $17.2 billion a year Fortune 500 company that their bread and butter in almost 100 years has been diesel engines. Now, they've chosen to turn the corner and go electric. Go electric. And their first Good electric. For them. Good yeah, for and them. so their mindset is there that, you know, go along or be left behind. So I'm glad that Gillig and Cummins, our longtime partners, have chosen to be leaders and that we're moving forward with them to bring a bus to market as part of that federal grant. Okay, so federal grant, um, $750 apiece, at least for now. Yeah. Um, deadline 2035, the city deadline, to change out, uh, among other things. I mean, I'm sure there are other changes too, but on this one item, change out all the diesel buses in the city mm -hmm. for electric buses, presumably the Gillet, Gillet, Gillet? Um, just for this, this, this purchase. Oh, just, okay, yeah. but whatever manufacturer it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, between now, 2018, uh, you said the first one comes a year from now? Yeah, we'd like to have the first one in probably at the start of 2019. 2019, yeah. uh, on the road. Mm -hmm. Operating within the schedule, within the fleet, so to speak. Yeah, normal, a normalization, just a regular bus, just one of the fleet. Okay, <laughs> and then and, and gradually introducing more of these, mm -hmm. maybe the same brand, maybe different, who knows, mm -hmm. um, over time uh, to to achieve 100% by 2035, which yeah. is 17 years, 17, eight, 16 years from next yeah. year. So, um, question, um, you know, uh, how do you have to? How, how fast can you go on this? Because ultimately, it's a matter of the federal funding and the money and, and taxes and politics and, and changes of mayor and mm -hmm. administration and city council. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a minefield out there, really, to get where you have to go. Um, how fast can you go? I mean, so one in, in the beginning of 2019, how fast do you see it? Because ultimately, you have a fleet of how many? 500? Five, uh, over 500, about over 540 500. right now. Yeah. yeah. And so what we have to do is, is it's so much of us just pivoting. You know, we're not, you can't turn a ship real hard in, into this direction. And it, the mix of renewables that we, we've committed to use be, be, you know, before 2035, that could be anything. You know, and I don't want to, I think now that the city has a chief resilience officer appointed, Josh Stanbro, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about what is a resilient source of energy. So for me, I think about it, I don't necessarily want a 100% electric fleet because if something happens that, uh, you know, impacts our electric production, we have a transit system that can't run and we have no mobility. So diversity is always good. You're going to get hydrogen? We would all consider hydrogen. You know, hydrogen, I think, is still in the test phases in terms of transit, you know, and electric vehicles were probably there 20 years ago. But now electric vehicles are a reality. They're in place. They're operating. Mm. Better and better all the time. Better and better all the time. And the price in terms of battery capacity, storage, and range will, will go up as prices come down. Yeah. So, you know, electric is one prong. We'll be looking at other, you know, alternatives, including hydrogen. And you know, there's a significant, one of the, the unique things about our bus system is we do some really long routes. I mean, our Route 55 goes from Ala Moana over the Pali um, into Kaneohe, runs along the whole Windward Coast, crests the top of Kahuku, ends in Haleiwa. It's a long way for a battery. It's a long way for a battery. It's torturous grades going up the Pali. Perhaps those get swapped out last with diesel electric hybrids. Um, the diesel can be sourced from biofuels. And I think our biofuel production is ramping up. Mm. And while earlier on, you know, we, are, the engines were not made to, you know, tolerate a little bit of how the, the mix of biofuel 
existed. You know, nowadays the engines are more manufactured to accept biofuels. Okay, so we have electric, pure electric, just yep. like cars. We have hybrid electric mm -hmm. with using a certain amount of diesel. Yeah. Um, less, but still diesel. Mm -hmm. And then we have, uh, um, did I mention hydrogen? Yeah. Um, and then biofuel, that's another one you've introduced. So yeah. the, any other possibilities for the fleet as it will exist in 2035? Well, we're open to looking at anything. You know, we, we really want to look at how we can accept and implement. You know, we don't want something where the initial cost of entry is um, infrastructure-wise. I don't want to spend, you know, 10 buses worth on just a fueling station. You know, there, there's, there's those kinds of, of sure. balancing of, of budget that we need sure. to do. Well, isn't it, isn't, isn't it, don't you get a better economies of scale if you say, I want all one kind because I only want to have one kind of fueling station and I don't want to have different, I don't want to have five different fueling stations, you know, for five different types of buses. Exactly. And, right. you know, I think our, our, our maintenance guys would, would definitely hop on board. They probably, if I were to say we're going to do one kind of everything, and we're going to have one method. I'm sure they would cheer that on. <laughs> but, you know, resilience again. If that one source happens to get quashed, we don't have an alternative. Yeah, sure. So we do have different um, bus um, divisions or maintenance homes for the different vehicles. So we could diversify our fueling based on where the bus is housed out of. In terms of green, uh, would you agree with me that pure electric, um, which is fueled by electric generated from pure green sources, mm -hmm. you know, purely renewables, is the most pure in terms of climate change and sure. carbon, you know, sequestration, carbon in emissions into the air. Um, so that it all depends. You have to, and I'm glad you mentioned, uh, what did you call it, uh, with the, uh, the, the utility? Uh, the they had an acronym that you were rolling out. EOT. Electrification of transportation? Yeah, EOT. Yeah. Yeah. EOT, remember that, EOT. Yeah. Um, so you need to have EOT coming from the utility. <laughs> because if the utility is using, <clears throat> um, you know, diesel, you're not really getting a benefit. It's quiet. Yep. I give you that, but you're, not, you're, not, you're still using diesel, fossil fuel, to run the buses. Yep. So you have got to be working in parallel with them the whole way through this period. Yeah, and it's not just about government shifting their role. All the partners that come along have to shift their role. And I like to say that this was the first time um, we recently went to a, a transportation um, convention, a huge, huge convention in Atlanta, Georgia. And we partnered. We went along with the different county providers. We went along with some of the private transportation providers. Hawaiian Electric was there. It's the first time we all kind of linked arms. And we showed up in a big mob to every single bus manufacturer. And the bus manufacturers were kind of floored. They're like, how did you get all these people in the same room to talk about this? And I think you know, individually in other municipalities, the government can't do it alone. You know, and, and they've other places where they tried to deploy a, a good amount of, or even one electric vehicle, they've run into problems with the utility, you know, the municipalities, and even other departments. So our talks with with Hawaiian Electric have been productive to the point where we realize if we were to charge an electric bus during the peak demand time, it does not pencil out to be cheaper than diesel. So we have been working with HECO to devise a charging strategy where yeah. they have something called the duck curve, sure. where when the sun's productivity is, is high in the sky and you know, all that solar energy is being fed into the grid yeah. from photovoltaic systems, say between you know, just 9 a.m. or 3 p.m., let's say, all that energy is getting fed into the grid. Nobody's home using, spending down that, that energy. So we'd like to actually charge our buses, and we hope to get a, a very good tariff to help spend down that excess energy and thereby allowing HECO at, at some point to maybe allow more solar on the grid. So it's yeah. a real partnership there, but if you can imagine all that coordination that has to go on with that. Yeah. And even for us, we have to upend for what, you know, for the longest time, probably for 100 years in transit. We, send, we fill a bus up with diesel, it goes out on the road all night, it comes back at the end of night, and that's, that's Fill it what up it does. again the next day, yeah. Yeah, but now we, we have to bring the bus back, charge it, because that's when it's cheap. And then we see the huge savings in energy costs. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we don't have time for that conversation now, but yeah. uh, you know, si similar issues exist with rail. Yeah. Um, do you ever see a, a, a time when we'll be putting panels on the top of the bus to sort of trickle charge it as it depletes? The amount of power that actually is required by that, it, it probably you wouldn't be able to see the 
the ratio of energy Wouldn't production that you need. But we, we have looked at putting, um, charging um, solar on top of the stations to just power those lighting stations. and, you know, on, on those on those bases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you know, uh, finally, our last uh, discussion, so to speak, John, is, uh, you know, how do you how do you get this done, given all the changes, to, you know, in a, in a free society, <laughs> you know, with all the, t the tumult of government and all that, and the change administrations, uh, how do you get that done? I mean, let me add one thing I think is clear. You've got to have people trained in planning, Correct. like you. You know, you're a breath of fresh air <laughs> to you. have you there. You're not political, you're a professional, and you're trained in something the community needs. But you also have to get the community up on this, and I and I suspect that was that was so when you went to that conference was in Atlanta, when you went to that conference to see all these people from all over the country, things are changing. People are coming together on municipal transportation, and you're part of a movement. But how do we how do we ensure that these plans will be realized? How do we ensure that city government remains responsible, a responsive, responsive to you know public, the public um, need, the public wish. Uh, for complete streets, the public wish for clean transit. What do we What do we do? And, and if you wish, you can you can tell them on camera one. You can turn your chair, <laughs> you can look right there, and tell them what they ought to be doing and thinking in the years going forward. I don't know that I want to actually address the public right on as a hypnotic thing, but I will address to you. While I think you've upsold my role in this, <laughs> I do think the the strength and how we do this. It has to exactly as you said. It has to be people based. And you know, in Hawaii, we have a strong base of continuous labor. You know, I might go out with the mayoral administration, but I have to impart upon the people that I work with that these relationships, you build them. So no matter who's in charge, the mindset carries through. And I think that's the, the seeds of what is being built right now. And with strong partners in, you know, in the community and the environment, I think there's enough upswell that we can carry these, these motions forward. And we can just have a better livable community, in, at least in terms of transportation. Yeah. Thank you, John. John Nauchi. Thank you. Ex De Deputy Director of DTS, Department of Transportation Services here in Honolulu. We wish you a long life and long participation in all of these issues. Thank you. <laughs> Aloha. Yeah.